Welcome to the fifth in the Pillars of Democracy series sponsored by the Library of Congress in partnership with the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution. I'm John Haskell, director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. We live in a challenging time. Polls show that the major institutions in American life, in government, and in civic life are less trusted and less respected than at any time in recent memory. In an effort to grapple with the question of how their decline can be counteracted, we are bringing together historians, political scientists, legal scholars, authors, and practitioners from across the political spectrum. The idea is to create a fuller picture of the challenges facing institutions in America, as well as institutions' potential promise. Last month, we looked at the administrative state. Today, we consider an institution similarly not to be found in the Constitution, political parties. Indeed, although many American, early American leaders thought them dangerous to the new government, party politics became a central part of our political system. Let me introduce our panelists today. Henry Olson, a Washington Post columnist and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center joins us. Henry's career included a stint as a political consultant and three years working for the California Republican Caucus in the General Assembly. After graduating from the University of Chicago Law School, he clerked for the Honor Honorable Danny J. Boggs on the United States Sixth Circus Circuit Court of Appeals. He then began working as an analyst and scholar at several think tanks, including the Manhattan Institute and the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of The Working Class Republican, Ronald Reagan and the Return of Blue Collar Conservatism. His biennial election predictions have been widely praised for their uncanny accuracy, and he's a frequent guest on television and radio. We also have Tasha Philpott, a professor at the University of Texas's at Austin's Department of Government, where she's also affiliated with the Center for African and African American Studies, the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis, and the Center for Women's and Gender Studies. Tasha's research focuses on the conditions that enable marginalized groups in American society to function in a more democratic system. Her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation in public and published in political sciences top peer-reviewed journals. She has also authored three books, the most recent of which is Conservative But Not Republican, The Paradox of Party Identification and Ideology Among African Americans. Next, we have Sophia Jordan Wallace, an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington. Her PhD is from Cornell University. She specializes in Latino politics, representation, and immigration politics and policy. Her research has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the Social Sciences Research Council, the Dirksen Congressional Center, and most recently, the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, where she held a chair. Her co-authored book, Walls, Cages, and Family Separation, Race and Immigration Policy in the Trump Era, was published last year. Last on our panel, we have Lee Drutman, who's a senior fellow in the Political Reform Program at the New America Foundation. Recently, Lee published Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, the case for multi-party democracy in America. And he was the winner of the 2016 American Political Science Association's Robert Dahl Award given for, quote, scholarship of the highest quality on the subject of democracy, unquote. He's the co-host of the podcast, Politics in Question, and he writes for the New York Times in 538. Lee has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. Please note that we're leaving time for questions at the end of the conversation. Please submit your questions through the chat function on Zoom, and thank you for turning in, tuning in. Let's turn to the discussion. When we think of institutions that are in trouble, not trusted by the American people, we automatically think of Congress, the media, and so forth. With political parties, however, the complaint is usually by partisans on one side or the other, about people on the other side. Democrats and Republicans seem like cats and dogs. But political parties are essential institutions of democracy. Indeed, no modern democracy has existed without them. Today, we look at parties not as a debate between Democrats and Republicans. Instead, we look at the party system as an institution asking the question, is this institution serving its intended purpose? To get at this, it's useful though to get back to basics. What is the definition of a political party? This sounds like an easy question, but it is anything but so in the United States. In recent years, political science has offered this descriptive definition of parties in the US. Parties are informal organizations of intense policy demanders 
to coordinate with other groups to win control of office so as to pursue their policy goals. These policy demanders control politics in the US by nominating candidates with whom they agree. Let's think about that definition. Uh, I'll start with Sophia. What would you add, of, add or subtract in a, in a descriptive sense to that def definition to help us understand better what parties are? Thanks so much, John, and thank you for having me as a panelist. I'm really excited for this conversation. I think that, you know, this is a good working definition in some ways. I mean, some tweaks that I might offer include that parties are really critical in providing information to the public. Um, they definitely cue different positions to the public, whether we agree with the parties in what they're telling the public and those positions, they certainly play this role. Um, and I do think that people whether they are voters or not, I think they do um, absorb messages from the party. That's definitely a role that they play. Um, and that shapes our public discourse on what issues are important and what things people care about. That I in no way mean to undermine that the public doesn't also articulate things to parties. They absolutely do. So it goes both ways. But parties do play an important role in signaling to the public. So I would definitely add that. Henry, what would you add or subtract to that definition? How do you think about parties, Henry Olson? Uh, American parties are, I think one of the things I like about the definition is the idea of an informal coalition, uh, because that gets to one way that American parties are different is that American parties don't have a top-down system. Even a leader like President Biden has to negotiate, uh, as we have been seeing painfully in open view for months, with people who owe him nothing other than some degree of nominal allegiance. It's much more of an early feudal system in that respect than the more tightly monarchical party systems of most other countries. So the biggest thing I would say is that the idea of a party as a separate entity from the dispute or the discussion between leading members of what the definition calls policy demanders, the idea of it as a separate institution is really a myth. I think it, there once was such a thing as a separate party that people would come together in private and then come out more unified, uh, but that's not what American parties are now. Uh, so uh, yes, party members signal things that then own or color the brand of the party, but there's not a party per se, where people sit down in the way, I think many people colloquially use the term outside of the political sphere. Yeah, and, and I think what you're saying is in sync with that definition, which I think you suggested, that it's about this informal network of so-called policy demanders, interest groups, or something like that. Um, Tasha, what would you add, add or subtract to the definition or what um, Henry Olson or Sophia Jordan-Wallace had to say? I think both of them um, brought up really important parts on both sides. I think parties inv are invaluable in terms of signaling to voters, um, at least you know, in a shorthand way, what a candidate can stand for, right? It's a way of being able to make decisions in a low information <clears throat> decision-making environment. But as Henry pointed out, I mean, there's a lot of uh, missteps that can be taken if you solely rely on parties because they're not disciplined. Um, and you do have people who, you know, can go completely rogue from the, the party. So in that sense, you have this, this pull and push where on the one hand, you know, citizens can benefit from parties and being able to have some minimal level of information regarding where they stand, but at the same time, will undermine um, in the American system where we, we don't have a cohesive, um, either party is 100% is cohesive in terms of where they stand and everybody uh, buying into that. Lee, what would yeah, you add lot, to that? A lot of great stuff here. Um, you know, I think I think it's important to understand that parties are coalitions, and uh, it's important to understand the the uh, as Henry was saying the, the really strange and unusual nature of American political parties, which are uniquely porous and that anybody can run as a Democrat or a Republican in a primary election. And if they win that election, they become the candidate. So, so we, we often think, well, Republicans should do this, Democrats should do this, but, but who's the they? 
that there's no single person who gets to yeah. decide that. It's kind of a tug of war between the politicians, between the policy demanders, and between the voters who play an important role in shaping what the parties stand for. Uh, and one thing that we haven't talked about uh, thus far is the extent to which parties are also identities for a lot of people. People think of themselves very much as Democrats or Republicans, and those identities really shape how people engage and view politics uh, and how people feel about winning and losing elections. Uh, people feel very personal when their side loses. And, uh, you know, there's ways in which uh, that is a good thing because it gets people engaged in politics, but also ways in which it's a limiting thing, particularly uh, given the nature of our partisan conflict. I mean, the, the other thing that when we think about parties in the U.S., uh, not only are they uniquely porous, but what's the other thing that's very unique about the U.S. is that we only have two parties, and those parties have to be these very, very broad coalitions in order to you know, encompass roughly half the country. And that also makes it very hard for there to be a kind of core of what is the party, uh, because it's very hard to, to run a top-down organization when you're trying to encompass so much diversity. And I think, although the parties are very top-down in some ways, uh, you know that there there is that top downness uh, only uh, is possible because so many of the divisions uh, are within the party are are being suppressed and marginalized, uh, and I think that also comes at a tremendous cost to, to our to representation. And, and we've always had this broad umbrella because you know, if, if you went back sixty years, the Democratic Party had the most conservative people and the most liberal people in Congress. And that's certainly not the case anymore. Um, one point I wanted to make is that, you know, Henry and, and uh, well, all of you at some level, Henry said it straight out, you know, it's not hierarchical. There's nobody at the top that says, hey, here's what goes. But I remember 30 years ago, the Democrats had Lyndon LaRouche supporters winning nominations for statewide office in Illinois at this, around the same time that Republicans had David Duke winning statewide nominations in Louisiana. And there was a sense, maybe I've got this wrong and maybe one of you can comment on this, but there was a sense at the time that there were people who could say, including President Bush, uh, the first President Bush, who could say, that's not us. And maybe that's harder to do now. I mean, Democrats disassociated themselves from these LaRouche people. Republicans disassociated themselves from uh, the Duke, uh, uh, the Duke, nominee, uh, Duke as a nominee. And that doesn't, is, is that can that kind of thing happen anymore? Yeah, yeah I think people can do that. Let's just remember, though, that uh, these things had, uh, in one sense, more of an elite effect than a mass effect. You know, the LaRouche people still received a million, you know, over, you know, I'm not sure whether it's over one or two million votes, but, you know, a substantial number of people just voted for the Democrat and didn't know or didn't care. And David Duke still received the lion's share of people who were willing to vote Republican, uh, even though the president of the United States, a Republican, dis disavowed him. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of a sense that, yes, it could happen today, but even when it did happen, it didn't actually uh, have a large effect on a whole lot of voters that uh, people tended to vote the party line anyway. Uh, for whatever reason, or party line meaning that they voted whoever was the nominee uh, for whatever reason. So I think we can overstate you know, the degree in which voters take cues from the top, which is different from a French political system that when the um, uh, father of Marine Le Pen uh, became unexpectedly the person who was facing um, Jacques Chirac in, uh, in uh, a presidential election, every other party endorsed Chirac, even though they were far to the left of him and their voters followed suit. And uh, there was virtually no leakage to, uh, to Le Pen that they actually listened to their leaders. That's <laughs> not something that American people have done for quite some time. And I, I, uh, if anything, it would be less today, but I don't think uh, it was ever as anywhere near as strong witness Franklin Roosevelt's effort to purge dissident Democrats in 1938 and how that fell flat on its face. <laughs> it certainly did, yeah. The, um, 
Any other thoughts on just defining parties before we move to a more normative approach? Well, I mean, the, the, the French system, of course, is a multi-party system and there's not that binary conflict as there is in the US. So it's easier for people to, to kind of uh, support a different party. Uh, party identities are, are less caught up in this zero sum partisanship that we have now. Um, the other thing about, um, you know, thinking about David Duke in, in 1988, he actually ran the Democratic primary. And it's, I think you're referring to 92 when you ran the Republican <coughs> primary. Uh, so, I mean, 1988, you, you know, you have David, <coughs> David Duke That's and Andrew right. Jackson running in the, in the same primary, which is uh, uh, kind of remarkable. And what that tells you is, and you were referring to this earlier, is that the Democratic Party used to have liberals and conservatives, Republicans used to have liberals and conservatives, and there were a lot more persuadable voters that might go either way. So the parties could, in fact, were, in, you know, had, had a strong incentive to distance themselves from the most extreme uh, folks claiming to be on their side, because doing so would alienate the, the kind of large number of moderate swing voters. Uh, w one of the most significant trends uh, in, in U.S. politics is the extent to which those swing voters have largely vanished. And so there are very few floating swing voters now. And so the parties have shifted to a much more of a base mobilization strategy. And in a, in a base mobilization strategy, it's much harder for parties to distance themselves from their most extreme elements. So you know, this is why Republicans are having a hard time distancing themselves from the, the Paul Gosars and the Marjorie Taylor Greens is because they represent some motivated base. And you know, if you want to argue the other side, you can say Democrats are not going to distance themselves from the, from the squad all that much because that's also a dedicated base of voters. So let's, let's uh, pivot to what parties should do. So Tasha Philpott, should parties, for example, channel the impulses and ambitions of candidates and elected, uh, and elected officials in constructive ways? And what would that mean in practice? I mean, should implies that there are a set of rules for parties, which, you know, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, they're not in the constitution. There, there isn't a subscribed way that parties should behave. But if we go back to the definition that we started with at the beginning of this discussion, if their goal is to facilitate the electoral process, right, get people who are part of their coalition into public office to achieve some um, policy outcome, then it, it would be to their benefit to facilitate um, the entryway of, of like-minded individuals into the electoral process. And, um, you know, whether that be in terms of uh, information uh, circulation or even filtering resources into them. Sophia, what would you, what is your thought on that question of whether uh, parties have a role or should have a role in, in, in channeling ambition? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Tasha. I mean, I think that um, both parties should be deeply invested in supporting and really kind of recruiting um, a really diverse set of candidates. And here I don't mean just racially and ethnically, I mean, gender, class, all kinds of things, because, you know, parties do play a really critical role in supporting candidates. And this can really just be boiled down to brass tax money support, really. Um, and it can be hard. We have a lot of different pathways into politics now that didn't, you know, doesn't kind of map on to our traditional story we tell about what needed to be the backgrounds. And, you know, that may be a good thing. Maybe that has opened up some types of, of candidates that have emerged that are more representative. I mean, I always make this argument to my students that if you look at who is in Congress along a lot of different dimensions, even if we just use college education, right? The vast amount of people in the United States do not have um, a college degree, but yet many, oh, nearly all members of Congress have a college degree. And most have an advanced degree. Um, you know, so I think there's lots of ways in which parties, really it's incumbent upon them to um, recruit and support a really broad-based diverse set of candidates that will excite the public. Because I think it is a scary moment that there is a lot of apathy towards both political parties. And you want people to be excited about the people who are running and you want them to feel positive, at least about their own party. And that's not always true in the data that we have. Um, so there's lots of concerns about how people feel towards the other party, but even towards their own party, we're not necessarily seeing 
really strong feelings. And that's partially reflected by what many of the panelists have said about when you have a two-party system and they have to be this broad, there's going to be a lot of different contingents within that party. So they're not going to love every part of what the party is doing. And maybe the party label doesn't really make sense to them. Um, so part of this, I think, is having a set of candidates that do appeal to people. And that might be different based on geography, for sure. You know, Henry, I know you've written on this, exactly the topic that Sophia raised. So what is it in parties? I mean, so we're saying, hey, there's no top-down hierarchy. Instead, it's a, you know, interest groups, policy demanders who are making things happen. And, and candidates can be self-generating. You know, if you have enough money, you can run. But a lot of people aren't, uh, or a lot of people need a little bit of a push. So who's doing that, Henry? in order for whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats to have a more diverse and more representative candidate base. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing about it, uh, because the American party system is so fluid and because we have our nominees chosen by direct voter primaries, which is unique in, uh, in the developed world, uh, there's only so much that a party entity can do, you know, that in all levels of government, party caucuses uh, come together. They're not the formal party, you know, but they are the Republican members of, or the Democratic members of, say, the House of Representatives. And they try and find candidates who are capable of running an effective campaign. And of course, to the extent that they are looking for things, you know, they would prefer to have a diverse set of candidates from across a variety of perspectives, although virtually none uh, are trying to find people who are not college educated. That is one thing that despite uh, what uh, we know, uh, it still is almost a requirement, not a formal requirement. You know, Governor Scott Walker did not have a college degree in Wisconsin, for example, but it's almost a requirement that you have at least a four-year degree from a low uh, um, admission standard uh, college somewhere uh, to, to be considered. But they're not the only ones, you know, you've got interest groups, you know, like the Democratic Socialists for America or our revolution on the or the Justice Democrats on the Democratic side or various Christian groups or the Club for Growth uh, on the Republican side who are putting their people forward as well. So you will often have a contest in the primaries between these different party or party aligned entities who have it out with the voters to try and say, we wanna shift the party brand in this direction or in that direction. Um, and so it, 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 it's because of our open primary system, it's very difficult for a party to do that because there are so many actors who are trying to own the party brand even if they're not part of the party hierarchy. Do the parties have any ability now? I'll turn this to Lee. Uh, do the parties have any ability to channel the behavior in constructive ways of Democrats and Republicans once they're in office? Well, uh, who are the parties? Uh, does, does Chuck Schumer have power over Democrats in the Senate? Does Nancy Pelosi have power over Democrats in the Senate? Uh, will Kevin McCarthy have power over Republicans if he's the speaker? I mean, they have some powers. They uh, can strip people of, of committee assignments and give them plum committee assignments to the extent that they care about that. Uh, they can help direct money uh, to, to their reelections. Uh, they can fundraise for them. So, I mean, th these are uh, some powers that they have. I mean, the, the, the biggest power that the party leaders have is controlling the agenda and deciding what gets a vote and, and what, you know, what, what is left, you know, on, on the margins. Um, and, and I do want to, and also, I mean, as Henry was saying, you know, that they, they are also actively involved in recruiting candidates. Uh, you know, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi are trying to find candidates who can win, but they're only interested in those candidates in those swing districts. Uh, so to the, if it's not a swing district or a swing state, then it's basically whoever wants to run. And that's a very, it's a very candidate centric model. And so who, who can run? Well, you know, people who, who have the self-confidence to think that they deserve to be a member of Congress. 
uh, people who have access to fundraising networks to help them finance the cost of campaigns, which is here where there's a, a real bias towards people not only with college degrees, but also with, with law degrees and other advanced degrees who have access to, to those networks. Um, you know, Nick, Nick Carnes at Duke has written, a, 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 done some tremendous work on looking at the bias towards uh, uh, you know, upper income candidates and how that affects representation. Uh, yeah, I, I think that is a tremendous bias. Now, if we had a party list system, as, as some European democracies do, parties are very self-consciously trying to figure out, oh, how, how do we come up with a representative list? The candidates don't have to run and, and nominate fundraise for themselves. You know, they, they're good members of the party and the party can say, well, we wanna make sure that we have a candidate list that is, includes lots of uh, women, uh, diverse representation, you know, diverse backgrounds. And what, what you see in, in party list systems is much more diverse representation. I mean, one reason that the US has uh, such a, a poor record in terms of female representation is, you know, because in a candidate-centered uh, electoral system, men are much likely to raise their hand and say, yeah, yeah, I, I could be the representative. Uh, I mean, women do just as well when they run, but men, men tend to be overconfident for these kind of positions. <laughs> so I'll shut up now. I've been, not, not that I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> um, Tasha, Tasha Philpott, I was curious whether you had a view about whether Again, in the normative sense, should parties, to the extent there's there's an organizational component, however informal, should they be trying to identify broadly acceptable candidates, or is it really about policy intensity? What's happening out there? I think, you know, from a strategic standpoint, they should be recruiting candidates they think can win. So if it you know, if we're in a time where you have moderates and you want to appeal to a more moderate base, then um, it would make sense to to try to recruit candidates that can appeal to a broad base. But if you have a situation where the parties are more polarized, then you, you want to be able to get someone, as Sophia said, that that voters are going to be energetic uh, and excited about. So I think just it depends on the nature of the political climate at the time. And, um, you know, strategically wanting to make a calculated effort to get the person who's going to ultimately get the electoral success. But Sophia Jordan-Walls, isn't there this tension between a lot of the activists and, and policy demanders and, you know, who, uh, who may not be as attuned to broadly acceptable or even electable as uh, more pragmatic people? Is that a tension in the party system now? I mean, I don't know if it's a tension in the way that you stated it, but I think there's a lot of evidence now that because of the primary system we have, there are party activists, right, that are controlling that level of, you know, who's emerging and who's being mobilized. And so I think the line between who's an activist and who's the party is a little blurred there because we're largely talking about party activists at that level that are right. pushing candidates forward. And at least there's a lot of research that indicates that, that that's actually part of how we've gotten into this really polarized situation. And on the other hand, people would say, yeah, but I want activists to play a key role regardless of the party because they're representing the voices of the people and elevating what people care about. Now, others might suggest yeah, but those voices may represent a very small number of people who are just very loud in their voices and may not actually be representative of a large number of people. And others could say, yeah, well, maybe they're giving a lot of voice to people who have been excluded. So I don't think there's one right answer about that, but I think it's definitely the case that as you've had more individuals kind of with a hand playing a role in who emerges as a candidate, it is much harder for parties to control. And it's very clear after the 2016 presidential election, you know, the party did not decide, right? Um, and that was one of the big take takeaways. And so even though we had largely said the party is the one that determines who is going to be the candidate, that, that isn't what happened. And that's not who became the president. Um, and so I think we have to take a step back and ask, well, going back to our original question, who is the party and what exactly does yeah. the party control? Who is the party? Who are we referencing? And is that really a singular entity or are there, as Lee suggests, in specific contexts, ways in which specific elites 
have specific powers, but there isn't really this one big party that is is kind of the master puppet maker kind of thing. So, so uh, Henry, if 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 the if the primary system, whether it's the presidential level, but there's you know hundreds and hundreds of elections at the state and local level, whether federal or otherwise, the primary system uh, bends in the direction of of rewarding ideological intensity and maybe plurality winners if there's a lot of candidates, which doesn't mean you're broadly popular at all necessarily. Um, what can be done? Well, yeah, I think one of the things that we did not have presidential nominees selected almost exclusively through presidential primaries until after 1972. That even in 1968 or 1972, where primaries were important, the bulk of delegates in both, you know, the Republican convention in 1968 and the Democratic convention in both uh, years uh, were still selected by party elites at conventions or, you know, it's, you know, with respect to simply governors or party chairman deciding. Um, if we are concerned that the current system rewards activists or in the case of Trump, uh, basically encourages the hostile takeover of a party by an outside element, um, then the only solution is to go back to the old system, which is some form of non-primary selection uh, that has its own issues, you know, are the elites who, you know, it's not clear that the elites in the Republican Party in 2016 would have chosen somebody who was electable because they were clearly out of touch with their own voters, much less the swing voters. Same thing I think is true in the Democratic Party. But if our concern is that the primary electorate system has diffused the ability of parties to mean anything or establish some form of party discipline and also enables less um, reputable characters to slip through, you know, demagogues to use the ancient term, then the only solution is to move to the sort of closed party system that dominates in the rest of the world, which would then naturally give rise to more third parties that if there are a large number of people who can't penetrate an existing party, they'll form their own. And, and then it would be, uh, if, if the formal party has kind of, I mean, there are people in formal party positions all across the country and at the national level, but you know they don't have as much power as they used to. If you could turn back the clock, you'd be giving power to people who don't have it. I mean, Democrats tried for years to have super delegates make a difference, that is party leaders make a difference at their conventions and that it really never amounted to much as far as I could tell. Yeah, well, eventually with the Democrats, when they had the opportunity to do so, like in uh, the race between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, they punted. They chose, they basically said, yes, we are all super delegates. It's our decision. And we're going to go with the will of the people. Because, and that essentially eliminated the entire rationale for why they were there. Yeah. The, um, Lee, uh, parties, uh, you know, uh, we've had a discussion about this before. Parties, uh, well, let's put it this way, a democratic political system is meant to facilitate a polity's ability to grapple with public problems. And since our, our politics and our government is organized around parties, are parties functioning to support addressing public problems? Um, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I mean, they're certainly defining what the public problems are in ways that help them win elections, I mean, the, the problem is we have a somewhat dysfunctional and gridlock system of actual governing, and precisely because we have political institutions that are set up to encourage broad compromise and broad coalition building, and we have a, a majoritarian electoral system that's evenly divided, that it is... Uh, pushing us into this incredibly divisive, non-compromise oriented politics. So at heart, we have a, an electoral system that's at odds with our governing system. Now, I, I happen to, to, you know, and there's some flaws in our governing system, but I think the general idea that you should build broad uh, majority support in government for, for policies is probably 
uh, a, a good idea. So then the question is, how can we align our electoral system so that it works better with our governing institutions? You know, and this is why it becomes such a strong supporter of electoral reform and you know, want to open up the party system, have more parties, because what you see in, in, in countries with more parties is that parties have to work together. They have to build coalitions. You, you build that into the system. Uh, you know, if you talk to somebody who, who you know, and does politics in Germany, they'll say, well, you know, of course we're going to work together and build a coalition because that's just how we do things. And we're not going to have these wild swings back and forth uh, as one party gets a 51% majority and takes over the entire executive branch of the Congress of the other party. You know, what we have now just is, is you know, mostly grid, gridlock punctuated by major swings. And, you know, no wonder people are dissatisfied in turning against our political parties and our political institutions because they're not working. Now, uh, you know, I mean, you, you can argue, uh, you know, if you're if you have a pure Westminster system as the as the British do, you could argue that maybe there, you know, having responsible two party system makes some sense. I mean, there's obviously some problems in British politics, but we don't have a Westminster system. Uh, we have a, a system that requires a lot of power sharing and is designed to diffuse power and force broad coalition building. So we ought to have a, an electoral and party system that works with that. And, and we don't have that now. Tasha, I'm eager to hear your take on the same question. Are our parties functioning to support addressing public problems? I don't think so. I, I've been, I, I suppose part of it is because I live in Texas and have been watching what's happening on the state level. But oftentimes I see more solutions looking for problems as opposed to problems that are inspiring solutions. And so I, I think there are a myriad of things that that should be the focus of policymakers. And yet over the last few years, particularly with the polarization, that we, we get off the things that are gonna affect the most people to the ones that are going to accumulate the most votes, to the issues that will accumulate the most votes. So in that respect, I, I think the, the parties have been doing voters a disservice by not genuinely looking at what the needs are at this moment, as opposed to thinking ahead as to how can I stay in office, how can I maintain power? Um, you know, to what extent is that okay? I mean, political parties aren't meant to be altruistic organizations. They're meant to, you know, get policy agendas forward through the electoral process. Um, but nevertheless, you do see issues of, of people falling through the cracks of not having a truly representative um, government on, on any of the levels, but but particularly, um, you know, at the, at the federal level. So, I suppose in, in the question, I mean, yes, they should be doing this, but you know, the answer that I would give is no, they're not. You know, and, and I was gonna to pose to you, Sophia, sort of building on what Tasha said and what Lee said is that um, uh, of course, politicians are always ambitious. They're always gonna, you know, accentuate issues that help them get elected and parties are gonna do that. But the, so, so the, 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 the special sauce is to marry uh, political incentives with solving problems so that if you uh, uh, address immigration in a, in a, in a good way, it's, it's better to do that for your political purposes than it is just to let the issue fester, right? Is that what's happening here? And you know, I picked immigration because you're a specialist on that for issues like immigration or many others. It's just, it's probably better for us politically, whichever party, not to address it because we mobilize our base by not doing so. Yeah, so I agree with Lee and Tasha that there, there is this disconnect between the electoral system and the governing institutions. And what that really does create, and you know, Lee didn't mention her by name, but I, I will go ahead and give a shout out to Frances Lee. I mean, she really hits the nail on the head, right? That this party switching and this belief that always the next election you're going to get control creates this perverse incentive to not work together and to make yourself seem very dissimilar. What that means is there's fundamental dysfunction in terms of actually getting anything done. And in other systems in the world, you know, you would not 
not be rewarded for not moving forward on policy, right? That you are held accountable for actually moving forward. And, and there are so many important public policy issues, as Tasha said, that really do affect a large number of people. We may disagree on the exact solutions, but we agree on the problems. And that's fundamentally how we used to talk about parties. They disagreed on the right approach, right? And the size of government in that, in the, in facilitating those approaches. That's not really how we talk about the differences now. And now we even really disagree even about what the problems are and the nature of the problems. Um, but I also want to offer that in the question when you asked me about immigration, you know, a lot of people think about immigration in this contemporary moment, and they don't zoom out and think about what immigration politics was like in, say, the 60s, 70s, 80s, even in the early 90s. And what I want to suggest to you is that there was actually a lot of agreement then and a lot of working together. And in fact, the last really giant piece of immigration reform was under Reagan, and it was bipartisan. And people forget that, right? They don't remember that. And if you look at some of the sort of GOP positions on immigration in the 80s, you would actually think that they sound like moderate Democrats today. And I mean that, seriously, if you go back and look at um, kind of primary presidential elections, that, that's what it sounds like. Um, and I think even in today, our really polarized environment, there is actually a lot of evidence that both in the public and um, amongst the elites, there was more agreement on some elements of immigration. I am not going to suggest to you in any way, and I have a long record of publications that suggest there's very big differences between the parties, but there are areas of agreement. But what happens is we get very trapped in wanting to fix everything about an issue in one bill. And so when I was much younger, I used to really, really want everything to be like a one giant bill that fixes everything. The more and more I have studied Congress, the more I realized that that has actually in our polarized situation led to no progress on a lot of really important issues. And so thinking about immigration, there are a lot of things that people do agree on. Now, whether they would electorally think it's going to be harmful to come to agreement with one another on those specific pieces, either because they either gave in to the Democrats or Democrats are criticized by progressives that are farther left. They're going to say that was a bill that didn't do enough. You should have never done that and then punish them for that. It is this tension between piecemeal legislation and comprehensive legislation layered on top of the polarization that makes it even more complicated to address policy issues, but it really is incredibly dysfunctional. And we, we really need to think, as Leah suggested, about ways to reform the electoral system to incentivize compromise and working together. You know, and, and uh, Sophia, I mean, you know, Republicans have, have shifted on immigration, sticking with that issue, which is important and, and uh, an interesting issue. Um, and Democrats have too, just in the last 20, a lot of Democrats have as well. It's an interesting issue in that sense. So, Henry, do you have a feel for what was different uh, about the parties, the party system in the 80s, where something like uh, that, what was it, the Simpson, um, what was that, Mazzoli, uh, Simpson Mazzoli Act, that, that uh, what, you know, whether it was a good or bad thing, the point is it was a bipartisan, comprehensive look at immigration reform that was supported by leadership of both sides. What was different about the party system where you could address immigration in a bipartisan way then? Well, you know, I think, as opposed to now, where it really does seem like it's almost impossible. Well, there's a number of things that are different. You know, first of all, the American party system, as it existed in the 1980s, was shifting from the century-long model uh, where it was based on largely on uh, um, ethnic and um, positional uh, experiences at a very discrete time that you still had people who were Republicans because their grandfather had fought for the union, even though they voted and were ranked 100% liberal. And the, you still had people who were in the deep South, uh, Democrats, even though they were voting conservatives because there was a heritage from the Confederacy. That was breaking down, but it was still present. And what that meant was you had that ideological diversity that allowed for some degree of cross-pollination. You also had the fact that Republicans, even though Reagan was president, hadn't run Congress for uh, 30 years. The idea that the Republicans could actually wield power remains 
um, something that was be uh, considered to be a fantasy. You know, Newt Gingrich rose to power because he said, hey, we can actually win. We don't just, and the, the idea of the, of, of one party sensing that they're uh, perpetually running uphill helped foster compromise because they didn't think that they could make their priorities uh, uh, top. And then I'd say the other thing is that um, the primary system existed, but the ability of outside groups to exploit it was in its infancy. That you go to what a primary that would have cost, you know, when I ran in my contested primary in California in 1986, I spent uh, around uh, $250,000 to represent a seat that had 300,000 people. It would not be unusual for somebody in that situation today to spend over $2 million. Uh, precisely because people now know that the primaries are where the game is at. So what you've had is, um, because of that, a massive movement into primaries so that people in safe districts aren't as responsive to leaders. They have to worry about being challenged in a way that they didn't have to worry about in 1986. So I'd say it's those three things that have all broken down, uh, some of which were natural, you know, that's only so long the legacy of the Civil War and the Great Depression, we're going to keep odd bedfellows in one political party, and some of which you know, the rules of the primary encourage outside groups to dominate. And that's something that the reformer of the partisan system would need to look at very carefully, is how much do we want to have mass voter primaries uh, run by the state, uh, which is uh, our system, but which is unusual and copied by virtually no one else in the world. The more we have that, the more we're going to have people looking over their shoulder at who can get on Fox News and who's going to oppose them in the primary and less willing to listen to a leader who can lead them to a better place in terms of a bipartisan compromise. So um, before we move to questions, I want to, uh, from the audience, I wanted to uh, pose $64,000 question to each of you. I'll start with you, Lee. If you had a magic wand that only worked for feasible solutions, that's the trick here, what would you implement to address the party system's shortcomings? If your reform is ambitious, how could it be put into action? And, and by feasible, do you mean constitutional? Uh, I mean, practical, that it actually might happen, that it's not just a pipe dream. I mean, you know, what, what, what's possible and feasible is what we collectively define as feasible. I mean, we have seen our democracy change considerably over the course of our history. I mean, if you had, you know, gone to somebody in 1902 and said, in 20 years, women will have the right to vote, uh, that there will be direct election of senators, there will be the direct primary, and states will have ballot and, and initiative, so, somebody would have told you, you're crazy, man. That's not feasible. Uh, you know, 1952, if you had said we're going to have massive voter rights uh, uh, legislation within 15 years, said, well, that'll, that'll never happen. Jim Crow is just endemic to the South. So, I mean, I, I think we have to be careful about, you know, saying what, what's feasible and what's not feasible. All right, then go for it, Lee. Tell so, us. Tell us uh, all of which is a preface. So, so, you know, I mean, tell us in one paragraph what we want to do. I, I would like us to move to a system of proportional representation with larger house districts, uh, multi-member districts, with larger house, uh, more representative house. Um, you know, I, I would I would take Henry's uh, suggestion of, of eliminating primaries. I don't think you need them when you have proportional uh, system with multiple parties. You know, we, we've got to do something about Senate elections. I think some version of, of, of frank choice voting might work okay for Senate elections. Um, and, you know, while, while we're at it, let's eliminate the Electoral College and move to a two-round national popular vote system. All right. Tasha, what do you think? What needs to change? This question, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. So, so what reforms of the party system do you think would make a difference that would be more, that would be constructive? Oh, I can't remember who said it earlier, but to somehow incentivize cooperation as opposed to um, the current system that, that supports more polarization um, so that there isn't, oh, it was Sophia, about 
um, trying to dominate the, the policy agenda so much in fear of losing its power in the next go round, but really thinking about doing the most for doing the most good for the most people, as opposed to singularly um, ramming through legislation to kind of prove that you've won, so to speak. Okay. Henry, are you ready to go? Yeah. I'm for you. Um, on a governing basis, I would say uh, one thing that could be done is abolish or severely curtail the partisan use of the filibuster. That the filibuster has existed for a long time, but it had not until the 1990s and really in the 2000s become a tool of party leaders to frustrate anything they didn't like in the majority party. And that's what's really led to the gridlock is because when you have a bipartisan system and you have a partisan use of filibuster, you basically require unanimous consent for anything to go through. Uh, and James Madison warns us in the Federalist Papers about the problems of requiring unanimous consent in a democracy. So uh, curtailing or abolishing the partisan use of the filibuster, requiring that at least some substantial numbers of people caucusing with another political party have to participate would uh, remove the ability of a minority to obstruct virtually everything. And you would see more legislation uh, go through. Uh, it may not be bipartisan legislation, but you would not have a situation where you have to get 60 votes in the Senate to do anything. Sophia, what, what are some of your answers? Well, there isn't a whole lot left after the others have gone through. I mean, I, I strongly <laughs> Sorry you're going last. No, no, it's fine. I still have one one point that no one said right. yet, but I, I strongly agree with Henry regarding the filibuster. And I really do agree with all of the things that Lee said it, that would fundamentally alter again this imbalance that he's identified between the electoral system and governing institutions. And Tasha's correct, we have to work for ways to incentivize people. And I think that will happen through structural reform. Um, I also want to just put out there that, you know, there's been a lot of critiques of the Senate as a not particularly representative body in terms of, you know, how who the Senate represents and how a very small number of people, as Henry has articulated, can stop something. And some of those people don't even represent that many people, right? And so they can stop anything from going forward. So that's it's just another data point to think about it. But the the new other point that I would add to this is I think that one of the most serious issues facing the world today is misinformation and the dominance of misinformation in many different spheres, whether that's through formal media channels, whether that's social media. And the reason why I raise that issue as is so important is because what we do really know from the political psychology literature is that when that information becomes so widespread, it's incredibly difficult to correct it, whether that's by party leaders, whether that's by your friends and family, but people really do change their political attitudes and behavior, and it does contribute to polarization. And so what I would say is we need to figure out how to tackle misinformation and the spread of misinformation so widely to really alter and negatively impact the public and discourse. And going back to your, you know, one of the questions you raised earlier, our capacity to solve public policy problems that face a lot of people, but also for people to feel positive about parties, I'm convinced that misinformation is a really, and disinformation are key components of that, of okay, really figuring and, out how to solve that. And, and that, that gets really right at the question of the role of parties, because uh, before social media, and certainly before, you know, before some other technological advances, the uh, the the, uh, the parties did serve as an, a, a bigger role as mediating institutions because people couldn't talk to each other and organize like they can on Facebook. I mean that that's a quantum leap, isn't it? Uh, the change that you can you know Twitter's different than Facebook. You can organize on Facebook. Um, you don't you you just blast away on Twitter. It's a little different, and but that has more of an impact. So one thing that's that's uh, was brought up, I think, by Lee. Um, that has come from our audience, and, I, I, and any of you can address this if you'd like. What lessons might we learn from ranked choice voting experiments in recent years? Perhaps especially in ranked choice systems with open primaries like Alaska, what role would remain for parties? What are your thoughts on the ranked choice voting that has 
taken a hold in, uh, you know, in, in Maine in particular and some other places. And I mean, it's used in New York City. Yeah, well, this would be a great chance for me to plug a new report that my colleague Marisa Strano and I uh, put out at the New America Political Reform website that uh, uh, what, what, we, what we've learned about ranked choice voting uh, and that really covers, there's been a, a, an emerging literature on what we've learned from, uh, you know, from experiments in Maine, you know, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the, the lesson is that ranked choice voting probably has some, you know, mo modest benefits. Uh, I, I think particularly in primary elections in which there's a crowded field that can help parties kind of, uh, you know, find the, the, the most broadly acceptable candidate. I think it does encourage, you know, a little bit more uh, diversity in terms of the candidates who, who enter and the, the ideas and you know, encourages some new, new voices into politics. Um, you know, but within the, the single member district context in which it's been used in the U.S., you know, the, the effects have largely been muted because you're, you're still going to basically wind up with uh, with two two parties in, you know, with, you know, top two. It's going to sort of orient towards two candidates as long as you have, you know, single winner districts. Um, I, I'm extremely skeptical of open primaries. Uh, we have put out uh, another report earlier this year, uh, what we can, you know, what, what we know about congressional primaries, again, looking at all the literature on congressional primaries and various states have done various things, um, including California's top two open primary, which has, you know, largely been a, a, been, been a very mad reform that hasn't changed all that much and something that lots of people ha have looked at. There, there's no evidence that um, states with open primaries elect more moderate compromise oriented candidates than states with closed primaries. In fact, in some cases, they may elect less compromise oriented candidates because if anything, independents are more anti-system. <coughs> Donald Trump did much better in states with open primaries that allow independents to vote. Uh, you know, if... <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm interested in what happens in the Alaska top four open primary in which Murkowski is running. I mean, a lot of it is, it, you know, is going to be come down to the peculiarities of, of that race. And ultimately, whether Murkowski wins is not going to have a whole lot to do with the, the you know, primary system or the ranked choice voting system. It's going to have to do with the fact with, with whether Democrats decide to basically stand down and, you know, not really run a candidate as they did in 20. 10. Uh, it's an interesting experiment. I, you know, I'd like to see it in more states. I, I don't think it's going to make a, a ton of difference in who wins, but, you know, I, I like the creative ferment of, of experimenting with things, but, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I would just get rid of the primary altogether and give parties back the opportunity to choose their candidates and let there be more parties that, that are offering candidates. So if one party nominates an extremist, then, you know, people have more more options to choose from. Henry, what, you know, you're a Californian and uh, Lee's talked a little bit about the open primary. Do you have views on that or ranked choice voting? Yeah, you know, the open primary was touted as something that would bring moderates to the fore. And in fact, it hasn't done anything of the lot sort uh, because there aren't enough people in either party who are willing to leave their party behind to support somebody who is more moderate. Uh, you may have moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats, but that's still basically uh, contesting within their own partisans. There's not a Democrat who will cross over to vote for a moderate Republican in a top two all party primary or vice versa. So it's been you know, the reform that was promised much and has accomplished nothing. Um, I'd be perfectly happy with doing away with open voter primaries and giving parties the old control that they had uh, precisely because it then forces uh, conflict out into the open. It may very well be that these outsider groups uh, are stronger than the incumbent parties, but then they should have their own infrastructure that provides clarity and information uh, to voters. You know, like right now within the Democratic Party, is the Democratic Party the party of the socialists or is it the party of moderate reformers? And the answer is yes, because <laughs> it contains all of those people. Uh, you know, there are eight to 10 people who are democratic socialists, and there are many more people who are moderates, and they all have the same label. Um, abolishing the pri open primary uh, would create more parties. And then ranked choice voting can be an interesting reform. Once you have multiple serious parties, then you can have them contest one another, and then 
the voters of the losers have to decide, you know, like if a Republican lost, would they rather have, you know, a, a uh, vote for the candidate of America first, or would they rather vote for the candidate of the Democrats? And what if it's, uh, you know, the progressives instead? They, it allows people to, uh, it forces people to make a majority choice, but it also allows for a lot more competition. And that's something I think uh, would be beneficial in the long run to uh, the American party system. Tasha, where are you on the on the ranked choice voting and electoral reform perspective? I was thinking as <clears throat> as Henry was talking, it, it's interesting what a dynamic it would create in the short run. So, if Henry, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things you're saying was that um, the parties would pick their own, and then people who were kind of at the fringe would just kind of pop up and create maybe their own party. Is that Right. I mean, a party would either have to choose to include the, you know, right now, a party cannot choose who owns its label. So, you know, you've got Cori Bush a, a winning a primary against um, um, uh, Mr. Lacey Clay. 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 Yeah, Lacey Clay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, if a party chooses to establish a more coherent brand that will necessarily push people outside of that brand outside the party. And then they have to either surrender or fight and fighting means a new party. So if you had moderates uh, in charge of the Democratic Party, they would make sure Democratic Socialists can't tarnish that brand, you know, or progressives or, you know, depending how wide they want to or exclude. And the same thing is true of Republicans, you know, that you've got lots of Republicans uh, who would just love it if they defined the party in a way so that Trump friendly Republicans couldn't claim the label. But then those people get to fight by having their own label. And that gives competition and breaks down the two-party system, at least in the short term, into a multi-party system. Yeah, so my fear is that even if we think about a, a cohesive party in selecting candidates to run, you're going to go with what you know. So I think that ultimately you'll get a lot of women and uh, racial and ethnic minorities excluded, uh, for one thing, because they're less likely to have the resources to get on the radar and to be you know, part of the inner circle to run. But I also think you know, for the reasons that we don't have a third party system right now is that um, you know, when it comes down to it, this is what we're used to. We're gonna stick with the status quo and we're gonna be afraid to throw away our vote on a, on a third party candidate that probably won't win. And Lee has the answer to that, right? Sophia, what's your, what's your view on uh, ranked choice and other electoral system reforms? I mean, I think for me, it's less about whether they're, you know, I agree with Tasha that there will be voters that decide that so this is too risky and they're not really sure about what, what, whether this is going to yield the benefit that they want. Going back to our definition of what's the function of parties, they'll be very unsure about what this other party thing is going to be. And I'm not sure that they'll do it. But I do think the thing that I like about these ideas is whether they actually work in it of themselves. I do like what Lee suggested that at least there's creati creativity thinking about what are new ways that we can reform these processes in ways that might yield a better result, that might be um, something that's more representative. These particular reforms may not have achieved that objective, but at least we're trying some things. I don't think this is the end of it. And I do really think that we should continue to try to innovate on this. But I think that is one of the important lessons is sometimes people say we shouldn't innovate and try things because you never can and it'll be too complicated to do it. But what these things have shown is actually they have been implemented in elections and whatever was their effect, we can quibble about whether it was it achieved its state of objective but they were able to be implemented. And sometimes I do think people um, kind of prejudge and say, this can never actually happen. This can never be implemented much in the way Lee started and you know, the prior question um, and use that as a basis for not to implement a reform. And I think that we've clearly shown that that's not true in different geographies at different levels of government, it, is, it has been possible. So uh, we, have, we have someone in the audience, Henry, who, who uh... Is, is very interested, and I'm sure there's a lot of people very interested. If you could flesh out the, the, ref, the filibuster reform ideas you have, and I know other people, Sophia mentioned she was interested in that. Um, how would that work? What, what, what are you saying when more set, with more specificity? Yeah, what I'm saying with more specificity is there, that you should either limit the instances in which a party can filibuster on a purely partisan basis or require 
a, a low but real member, number of members of the other party to support the filibuster or both. Example, right now, all you need is 40 Republicans to filibuster. Uh, or in the, when the Republicans control, you need is 40 Democrats to filibuster. And that's been something that has been, de, you know, it's not our history, but it's been our history for the last 20 years. Require at least three members of the other party to back. It. So to get 40, you need to have 37 members of one party and three from the other. Uh, that's a low threshold, but it's a real threshold. It means that one party can't block the other party. They have to convince somebody from the other party in order to stop these things. Uh, the other thing you can do if you don't wanna go that far is, and this is harder to, I've always tried to figure out how to do it so that it couldn't be game, but say, you know, like Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer, when you're in the minority, you only get seven types of bill, or seven bills that you can filibuster in a year so that you can't hold up everything. You know, so like if Republic, Democrats want to throw 10 different ideas, and this is where you have to define it in a way so that the Democrats couldn't put up a shell or the Republicans couldn't put up a shell bill, and that takes up one of the seven, and then, aha, the same idea comes in in another piece of legislation. But, you know, the idea is, you know, pick your priorities and fight on those, but let us govern on the rest of them. Um, one or both of those ideas would, would reduce the times that the partisan filibuster was uh, was used and that would increase the ability of a majority to actually govern. The most radical idea would be to simply abolish uh, the partisan filibuster at all, you know, have a very high threshold uh, or regional threshold, something that requires it to be other than the will of one party blocking another party. Uh, that's the basic idea and those are a few examples of how you could implement. Yeah, that one where you, you would need uh, three people of the other party in order to filibuster the majority party. You know, you say that's a low threshold. It's actually a high threshold these days, right? <laughs> well, by low threshold, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, you can imagine a, a high, it's, it, it's a low th threshold because it's obtainable. I mean, you could imagine theoretically right. getting three. It's hard to imagine getting 15. <laughs> you know, yeah, impossible right, that it's low, but yes, it's, we're so part, we're so part, uh, part of, we're so polarized that the idea that you could get three Democrats to cross over and support with you is really radical. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's the sort of thing people respond to incentives. You know, I've thought yeah. for throughout all this year is that yes, Cinema and Mansion are taking the public heat, but my guess is there's actually a lot of moderate Democrats who are pretty happy to let them take the public heat and working privately. But if they had to, you know, come out, you might find a Mark Warner or a John Tester be willing to join a filibuster on something that they really care about because they are not in lockstep with the left of their party. So um, you put something like that in, you might actually be, and the same thing in the other situation is that gives power you know, to people like Murkowski and Collins or Ben Sass or Mitt Romney, it makes them put their money where their mouth is. It's very interesting. Um, any responses to that from the other panelists? That reform, I hadn't heard that specifically before. It's very interesting. I, I love it. I hope you'll be writing a column about it, or maybe you have already. Um, I've written a column on the partisan filibuster, but I have been planning to write one about this specific idea. Um, yeah. I haven't found the, the right hook, but maybe I should just throw it out there. Uh, you, you absolutely should. A hundred percent. As you were talking, I was like, wow, he should write a column on this. <laughs> you really should. No, I mean, because now. no political scientists are often, uh, you know, unwilling to, they're willing to identify this is the problem and this needs to change. Not often willing to identify the solutions. Lee's exceptionally good at doing that amongst political scientists, but usually we're afraid to do that. I feel like this is a really critical. It really, it, it really made me think like, huh, I've never thought about that as an idea. I'm very firm in my belief that I think that filibuster needs reform. How to actually do it is something I have spent less time thinking about because I really focus my energy on, well, how is it, how are we ever, any party ever going to have a super majority, especially given everything we've said about how competitive elections are and how slim the margins are. So we know that that's the problem is the way the filibuster operates. And so I think this is a very interesting novel idea. Yeah. And it does change the incentives. It's all about incentives in these situations. Yeah. 
and it does change the incentives a lot. Yeah. Um, right, which is why I, like I said, which is why I phrase it as low rather than high. Because <laughs> you can quibble between three or five or seven or whatever number is that once you've changed the incentives and you give people power that they don't have, you encourage them to exercise that power. Yeah. <laughs> And it changes how how uh, Schumer McConnell responds because it, that, you know, the rules have changed. Ex exactly, it, you you change the, and the thing is, you know, what I would say in the column, which you both encouraged me to write, and which I, I suppose I will, is you know, ideally, you not that this would necessarily happen, is you do it at a date in the future. You agree on a bipartisan yep. basis that starting, you know, we will agree that we will amend, the, you know, that we will amend this uh, in twenty twenty four or twenty twenty six. So that it's not, oh, if we do it today, we're going to give Schumer this power. If we do it tomorrow, do it at a time when you don't know who's going to run the Senate. Agree that we're going to prospectively put it in there and uh, it becomes part of the rules that you have that you will automatically ratify and it becomes effective on January 1, 2025 or January 1, 2026. You know, the, the tough thing about it is Congress often puts things in law that will that will end later and then they change their mind. Right, but then that, but then that becomes a public issue. That's yeah. the thing. Is that if you if you did this, and they had the, you know, they read my column, they said, "Gosh, that's a brilliant idea." Finally, a political scientist or a columnist who says something sensible, and they come out and they play kumbaya and they pass it. Then going back on it becomes a political issue, and so which is why they probably wouldn't do it. But by putting it off, you say, "Okay, we'll do this. We'll solve the problem. We'll do it in a way that we don't know who's going to win." So um, this is a, a really interesting question that has come from the audience uh, and that uh, any of you can jump in on. What can we do to better align the reform community with the academic community? Uh, this person's discouraged by what seems to be a grave disconnect between those two with activists pushing comparatively untested and likely ill-advised reform. So what can we do to better align those two communities? Well, as the, as the non-academic, I'm going to absent myself from this question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let those PhD types talk. Any thoughts, Tasha? I think, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> this uh, cough is getting the best of me right now. I think part of it is we're in, a, in an environment where we're kind of anti-science. And so going to, you know, consulting people who have scientific evidence on a lot of these issues just isn't, isn't in fashion right now. But I think when we start realizing that social scientists are in fact scientists, and that we can bear, bring to bear some data uh, and evidence that would support, you know, one way or the other, a policy um, initiative. Then we'd be able to merge and have a, a, a more balanced conversation. What do, you, what do you think, Lee, Sophia? Well, I mean, it, it's something that I've uh, obviously thought a ton about, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, one uh, thing that that I've certainly tried to to do. Um, you know, at, at New America is trying to, to organize academics to do research that is answering questions that reformers have and, you know, trying to trying to bridge these two communities. I mean, we've had some conferences at New America. We've, we've started something called the Electoral Reform Research Group, which supported a lot of research around ranked choice voting. And, you know, we brought together practitioners and researchers who had you know, uh, really never been in the same room together. And actually, you know, people who were researchers and wanted to understand right choice voting, they, they talked to the people who were who were advocating and implementing it, and they got a better understanding of how those folks see it. And, and then the, the folks who are, are advocating and implementing it got a chance to talk to the academics who study it and, you know, understand what works and, and what doesn't work. So, you know, I think a lot of it involves, you know, bridging those gaps. You know, I think often the reform community doesn't want to hear from academics when they say this is something that's kind of marginal and not likely to have much of an effect, you know, which is understandable if you devote your, you know, if you spent years working for open primaries, you don't want to hear the research that says, oh, actually, this open primaries don't do anything. So, you know, that, that is a challenge, uh, you know, but I think just having more opportunities for, uh, at, you know, advocates, uh, reformers, uh, you know, to, to, to engage with academics and for academics to, to take the, what people on the ground are saying a little bit more seriously and actually talk to people. I mean, one of the, 
one, one of my criticisms with academic political science is that so much of it is based on survey data and <clears throat> analysis of survey data and sort of institutional data, and that so few academics spend time in communities and talking to people, understanding their actual lived experiences. And you know, it's it's nice to identify some you know clever regression discontinuity, but it's also interesting to talk to people who are engaged in the actual process of politics. You know, I mean, I read a lot of studies on. How, how the open primary does or does not produce more moderate candidates. I have not read any qualitative studies in which people have talked to candidates and campaign operatives in California and, and, and said, you know, how, how does, you know, how does this affect who, who runs? I mean, there's some, some good work. Daniel Thompson, uh, I would highlight, has done some, some tremendous survey work on looking at why people run or don't run. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful book on primaries. Um, I'm trying to it's and Anderson Harbridge and somebody else called Rejecting Compromise, in which they did some qualitative interviews and talked to, to people. Um, but Dan Butler. Just, sorry? Dan Butler. Yeah, Butler is the third author, right? Um, you know, and, you know, so uh, that is, you know, I, I think I, I wish academics would do more of that work and just talking to people and engaging with the reform community. There, there's such a such a divide and a, and a kind of joint, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of academics who feel like they're better than the reformers. And, you know, well, all reform is, a, you know, it, you know, is bad and, and, you know, we shouldn't change things and, you know, or, or they don't want to get their hands dirty um, somehow and, and like get to know their dependent variables. And, you know, reformers, as I said, are sometimes skeptical of academics because they just feel like academics are, are you know, in, in this sort of like world that's totally removed from, from the reality. I, mean, I remember working in, in Congress as an APSA congressional fellow and, you know, said, oh, oh, you're one of those political scientists. Well, everything that you learn is totally wrong and we'll teach you how politics really works. And, so, uh, you know, so one thing that hasn't come up, and this is the, the last topic I want to raise, because whenever I do panels of any kind about problems in the American political system, there's always somebody who says, well, it's all about gerrymandering. You know, I'm reading about Maryland's going to shut out Republicans and Texas and North Carolina are making moves to, to, uh, to change the situation for some Democratic members and Illinois the same way on the Democratic side, uh, you know, putting uh, Kinsinger in with, um, with LaHood. Uh, is, is gerrymandering an important factor in this? Is the districting process an important factor in, in the problems parties face, the party system faces, or not? I, I have lots to say on this, but I just spoke, so if there's somebody else who wants to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, this is something where I got my start as a professional, I was uh, doing redistricting, so I got to watch my plan thrown off the ballot by a Democratic controlled court by a partisan six to one vote. Uh, 40 years ago. Um, it exacerbates the problem because it makes more safe seats and reduces the ability of um, voters in the middle who still do swing the elections, even if they're fewer than there used to be, uh, from being able to exert their power. Uh, so, you know, you take a look at Texas, and there's really, based on current, of course, as we saw in the last decade, voter coalitions can change in unexpected ways, but they rarely do. And based on current voter coalitions, there's only one competitive seat in a state with 38 seats. Um, so that just increases the importance of open primaries, which increases the importance of ideological non-party actors, which reduces the willingness to engage in some sort of substantive policy debate and increases the zero sum mentality. Um, it's not decisive. It would that those trends would still exist. There's no way you can create single member districts where you don't have a super majority of safe districts between the two parties. Now, I don't mean super majority on one side, but, you know, in, every other country in the world that has single member districts has fair non gerrymandered districts, and they still have two thirds of the seats or more that are safe for the major parties in their, in their area, because that's just the way demographics is, but it certainly exacerbates it. And it adds to one other problem, which is one of the ways in which partisans look at what the other party is doing 
and say, see, they're against democracy itself. And that combined with our never ending, interminable, lie filled voter wars um, is just eroding the confidence that people have that elections matter and that elections you know, reflect uh, their will. And that is really, really bad for a democracy. Sophia, do you have any thoughts on that? Sort of the last word? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, we talk a lot about gerrymandering now, but gerrymandering is really old. I mean, partisan gerrymandering has been forever. In fact, the origin of the term really dates back quite a long time ago, um, <laughs> if we're talking about, uh, about it, you know, and so I think that there are moments where it's become worse. I think um, in competitive elections, I think it focuses attention on every single structural aspect that could be used to potentially advantage and discuss the, these things. And of course, with changing demographics in the US, um, redistricting and, you know, as we have another census, right, it is incumbent then upon localities, they must um, incorporate this data and consider it. And that, of course, brings up other controversies, especially given, you know, what is the current state of the Voting Rights Act in terms of post Shelby and, and in really there's no active formula. And so I think that there's all kinds of ways in which this is clearly an issue, but I think there's also ways in which people um, focus on this as a one unitary thing that is the key problem with everything. And I would agree it's a, an important thing. Um, I don't think it's the only problem that we need to focus on. And I do think Henry is correct that a, a really big problem is when we have voters and members of the public who are losing confidence in elections and losing confidence um, that the will of the peoples can be expressed through elections and that elections, um, the results will be accepted and that people will have trust and faith in our electoral and governing institutions. I think that's a really serious problem. Well, that's, uh, we're, we're going to wrap with that uh, comment. And I, I wanna say on behalf of the Library of Congress and the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution that we thank you Tasha Philpott, Lee Drupman, Henry Olson, Sophia Jordan Wallace for participating. This was a truly edifying conversation and uh, it will also be posted on YouTube in about two weeks. Um, let me encourage the uh, audience and we appreciate your participation in, in the excellent questions we received uh, to uh, fill out the survey that, will, that is made available to you so that we can uh, get your feedback. Thank you again and have a good evening. <laughs>